In chapter 4, we'll be looking at a variety of different types of inductive arguments, the first of which is the statistical syllogism. A syllogism is an argument with usually two premises and a conclusion that puts together information presented in the premises. In chapter 4, we'll be looking at a number of inductive syllogisms, syllogisms in which the information present in the premises can be put together in such a way as to make the truth of the conclusion probable, but not guaranteed. A statistical syllogism is an inductive syllogism in which the, its general premise, that is, the premise that makes a general claim, is a statistical generalization. You may recall that we've already talked about statistical generalizations. Uh, there are sentences that state that some portion of members of one class are members of another class. Let's take a look at this example of a statistical syllogism. 90% of freshmen at State University are residents of the state. Elena is a freshman at State University, therefore Elena is a resident of the state. This top claim here, that 90% of freshmen at State University are residents of the state, this is the statistical generalization. It's making a claim about the members of one class, freshmen at State University, uh, and their relationship to membership in another class, being residents of the state. In this case, the relationship is that 90% of those in the first class are in the second class. Then our second premise, we've got uh, a claim about a particular individual who's a member of that first class. And from these two pieces of information, we conclude that Elena is a resident of the state. We use statistical syllogism when we argue that what is generally, but not universally true or false, is also true or false of a particular case. So in our previous example, that particular case was the case of Elena, our freshman at State University. The statistical generalization in the premises is not always numerical, like it was in our first example. Almost all, most, very often, almost, never, and other terms can occur instead. Let's take a look at of an example where that's the case. Hardly any freshman had a philosophy course in high school. Oscar is a freshman, therefore Oscar did not have a philosophy course in high school. The form is the same here. We're talking about freshmen, a certain class of individuals, and their membership in another class, being the set of individuals who had a philosophy course in high school. And we're saying most freshmen are not members of this class, the member of the class of individuals who had philosophy courses in high school. Then in the second case, we pick out an individual again, like we did with Elena. This time it's Oscar, and we state that Oscar is a member of this first class being discussed, the class of freshmen. So from these two pieces of information, we conclude Oscar did not have a philosophy course in high school. It's unlikely, given that most freshmen, of which Oscar is one, didn't have philosophy courses in high school. The form of a statistical syllogism is this, where A stands for a particular individual and F and G stand for classes. X percent of all Fs are Gs. A is an F, A is a G. In the first case, Elena was our A, being a freshman at State University was the F, and being a resident of the state was our G. The class denoted by F is called the reference class, and the class denoted by G is called the attribute class. One way to assess the strength of a statistical syllogism is to see how high the percentage of Fs are Gs in the statistical premise. Obviously, a premise in which 99% of Fs are Gs is stronger than an argument in which only 30% of Fs are Gs. Similarly, an argument in which almost all Fs are Gs is stronger than an argument in which just some Fs are Gs. A second criterion for assess of strength for statistical syllogism is whether all available relevant evidence has been considered in selecting a reference class. This requirement is called the rule of total evidence. To see the significance of the following rule, let's add some info to our first example about Elena. 
Let's say that we uh, know the following information about Elena. Besides being a freshman at State University, she's got brown hair, she's 18 year old, she supports equal rights for women, works part-time in an office, and belongs to the Foreign Students Club. Okay, so the rule of total evidence says that we have to pay attention to all the relevant evidence in selecting a reference class. So the question becomes, what information is going to be relevant to how likely it is that Elena's uh, a state resident? Well, the fact that she's got brown hair probably doesn't tell us anything. The fact that she's 18 years old makes her a normal freshman. It might be useful information if, say, she was 35 or 12, but this isn't going to really add any new information because most of the people in the class of freshmen are going to be about this age. Um, the fact that she support, supports equal rights for women, um, there's nothing really unique about that to state residency, nor the fact that she works part-time in an office. So we're going to get rid of all this stuff. We're going to assume for the time being it's not relevant. But the fact that she belongs to the Foreign Students Club, that might be relevant for if it turns out that a high percentage of the students in the Foreign Students Club are not from the United States, then and Elena is a member of the Foreign Students Club, it seems more likely that Elena won't be a state resident. So this looks like it might be relevant. So let's say uh, we looked into the matter, and we looked to see what percentage of, foreign of members in the Foreign Students Club are residents of the state. And let's say we learn that only 2% of the members of the Foreign Students Club are state residents. We also know that Elena is a member of the Foreign Students Club. So now we have an argument of the same form of, as our first argument, only this time the conclusion is that Elena is not a state resident. So what are we to do with this? The first statistical syllogism we had concluded that Elena is a state resident, and the second one included that she's not. They can't both be right. They're contradictory conclusions. Well, the rule of total evidence is here to save the day. The rule of total evidence requires us to assign Elena to a reference class of freshmen at State who are members of the Foreign Student Club and who are also members of any other relevant class of State residency to which she belongs and for which information is available. There might be some class that she's a part of that we don't know about. We can't be responsible for that. But given the info we have, we have to make sure all the classes are covered. Well, going back to the info that we had, um, there's the relevant info that she's a freshman at State University, and we know 90% of them are state resi residents, and there's the relevant piece of information that she's a member of the Foreign Students Club. And we deemed that the rest of this information wasn't relative. Sorry, wasn't relevant. So the reference class that we have to use is going to be one in which we're dealing with freshmen who are members of the Foreign Student Club. And that's exactly what we'll do. Let's say we looked into it and found out that 5% of all freshmen at State University who are members of the Foreign Students Club are state residents. Elena is a member, is a freshman member of the Foreign Students Club. We can conclude from this that Elena is not a state resident. Of the three arguments we've given, this is the strongest one because it's the one that satisfies the rule of total evidence. In order to craft a successful statistical generalization, one needs to follow the rule of total evidence. An argument that fails to take into account all the relevant evidence available is a fallacious argument. More specifically, such an argument is an example of the fallacy of incomplete evidence. So in our previous case, if we uh, had available to us both that Elena was a freshman at State University and a member of the Foreign Students Club, and we didn't take one of those pieces of information into account, we would have been committing the fallacy of incomplete evidence. Of course, one of the tricky things is figuring out what evidence is relevant. Sometimes this is easier than in other cases. For our purpose, relative evidence is defined as any evidence that might influence the probability that an individual A has the property G attributed to it in the conclusion. So then the trick is figuring out which uh, pieces of, of information might influence the probability. Sometimes this is a tricky thing to do, but sometimes it's easy to tell 
when uh, the rule of total evidence hasn't been followed and the and the argument that follows is fallacious. Take this example. 98% of Fortune 1000 corporation CEOs are men. This is our statistical generalization. We've got uh, a claim about the percentage of Fs, Fortune 1000 corporation CEOs, who are Gs, men. In our second premise, we've got an individual, Anne Mulcahy, who is CEO of Xerox, a Fortune 1000 company. So this second premise states that A is an F. So the conclusion here is that A is a G, and Mulcahy is a man. Of course, um, the obvious problem with this is the fact that Anne is typically a name for a woman, and Anne Mulcahy is in fact a woman, not a man. So here we have a blatant failure to take into account the piece of information that Anne is a woman's name, typically not a man's, and uh, this makes it significantly less likely that Anne Mulcahy is a man. Okay, so we've got a bunch more types of uh, inductive arguments to look at. In the next lecture, we'll be looking at a few other types of statistical syllogisms.